political idolatry or abolition. The battle is on within the Republican Party on abortion. We'll break it down. Plus, what does a new survey tell us about attitudes on abortion around the world? And what do we need to do to push on to the end? All this and more today on The Simple Truth. I'm Jim Havens. It is Friday with Father. That's Father Stephen Imbarato, our co-host, every Friday providing cutting-edge pro-life commentary that you're not going to hear anywhere else. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. Always great to be with you. Father, how are you today? And will you lead us in an opening prayer? Yeah, everybody, I'm doing great. So, Jim, you have your Men's March uh, T-shirt on, and I got the sweatshirt on because my air conditioning here works very, very well. So, hey, let's model them for everybody here. (laughs) All right, there you go. And you can pick them up at themensmarch.com. Oh, I sound like Lila Rose now. You know, she's hawking stuff all over the Internet. Maybe we'll talk about that in the show. Let's pray. Name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, name your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, send the Holy Spirit down upon us, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to come together in your name, Lord. May your truth be on our tongue, on our lips, that we may proclaim your truth. Open up the hearts and minds of those who hear us and see us, that your truth may be heard. And your truth being proclaimed and heard, Lord, may we live your truth each and every day. In this hour we spend together and as we go forth, may we in some small way each day bring souls to salvation and bring an end to the scourge of abortion in our cities, our state, our country, and our culture. And we ask this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the great feast of the visitation. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Father. And uh, and yeah, just following up there, uh, you can go to themensmarch.com, get a bunch of information there, as well as check out uh, the shirts, the, the t-shirts and the sweatshirts if you're interested. But themensmarch.com, a big event coming up, Rochester, New York, Saturday, June 22nd, less than a month away. And uh, we invite you to support the cause as well. We do very minimal fundraising, only what is necessary for these events. No salaries or anything like that. And uh, now's the time where we are looking for folks to support this next event. So if you can, we appreciate that. TheMensMarch.com. But let's begin with some quick context on the big political news that has taken over since yesterday. The ridiculous Trump conviction in New York City that continues to diminish our nation And let's understand that we will only see greater and greater disorder in our nation as we continue to murder our own children. The ongoing daily mass murder of our littlest brothers and sisters, which we're all going along with and allowing to continue, is a rupture in our moral fabric, in our consciences, a dark mark upon the soul of our nation that has a sort of entropy that has and will continue to expand into greater and greater disorder and destruction unless and until it is rightly seen and dealt with, ended and eradicated. And we can thus turn the tide and start advancing the truth, goodness and beauty going forward and entrench the fundamentals of moral order that lead to real human flourishing. Father, this was the main reason I supported Trump in the 2016 primary when many were going with Cruz, Rubio or even Kasich at that point. It was because the evil of abortion was continuing and benefiting from the political status quo of both parties in our two-party system. And it seemed to me that the election of Trump would at least shake up that status quo and give us a chance for something to get done against abortion versus just more of the same Republican establishment lip service with no real action toward ending abortion. I don't know if President, uh, if, if a President Cruz or a President Rubio would have gotten us to overturning Roe, Uh, Certainly a President Kasich wouldn't have, I don't think. But as we've seen in this election cycle, Trump himself is a political idolater like all the rest with no strong principle on life. And we've seen him retreating on life and moving back to the old establishment status quo on abortion. So to me, the evil we saw yesterday with a sitting president using lawfare to get a conviction of his opponent on bogus charges is immediately bad and diminishing for our nation. Yet, as much as we don't want any evil, we do pray for good to come out of it, and there may be much good that comes from the kangaroo court conviction as it at least further shakes things up at a time when political momentum 
was moving back into status quo on abortion. And only if that status quo is shaken will the possibility of a political shift to end abortion become possible. So the election of Trump was the first shakeup that led to the Supreme Court overturning Roe and ruling that abortion is not a right. Perhaps the conviction of Trump will be the second shakeup that leads the Supreme Court to finally rule that abortion is unconstitutional and every human being, including the preborn, from fertilization onward, is a human person with a right to life and equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Father, your thoughts. Well, boy, you just laid a lot out there, Jim. I have to take a few seconds to process all that. But uh, one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is, of course, there is, and I, I've, I've said this, July 17th is the is the uh, sentencing of Trump. And as many people believe that he won't be put in jail, I don't run it past the Biden administration to put him in jail. And of course, it's a state offense, but this is the Biden administration uh, doing lawfare, as you said. And uh, how interesting it would be that we have up, we'll have up to 21 pro-lifers in jail come the November election for trying to save babies' lives. How interesting would it be if Trump, who brought us to this point with the Dobbs ruling overturning Roe versus Wade, if he's in jail, too. Now, the other thing that I pointed out on social media uh, and got a little bit of pushback because, of course, people are even some of the best pro-lifers are steeped in this political idolatry. I said that isn't it interesting now that that the that Trump has been indicted that he is a convicted felon, that's the talking points, that maybe this should be the impetus for them to go full bore on abolition through constitutional personhood because they don't have to worry about blaming the lost election on the abortion issue when indeed, if they lose the election, it'll be because the Democrats are successful in branding him as a convicted felon. But you're right, Jim, about this whole disorder, this whole mess, and we've been saying this all along. What is God going to bless? What What is he going to bless? You and I as devout Catholics with a supernatural outlook, supernatural eyes, as I always say, can see clearly that God is not going to bless where we are as a Republican Party, conservative movement, a pro-life movement, where we are right now. We're going to be talking about this quite a bit today. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's getting messier and messier and messier as the Republican Party moves away from its founding principles of abolition, as it moves away or towards, I should say, such immoralities as, as IVF. Uh, and, of course, the party has embraced IVF, if not as a platform issue, surely in a, in a, in a political mode, a political campaign mode. They've all embraced it. We talked about it last week. Uh, this is not something that God is going to bless. We need to get back to having a supernatural outlook, trusting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And standing, as we've been saying week after week after week, standing on the moral principle, the moral absolute, and the constitutional absolute, that we need to abolish abortion through constitutional personhood, and then trust in our Lord. And I think he will lead us as he led Gideon to uh, the great victory in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think... Um I think this uh, the, the Trump campaign is going to be uh, shifting their focus some, um, as you're as you're saying there, from what they've been doing, really way overly focused on retreating on life. Now, I think their attention is going to be a, a little bit different, and so this is where the momentum was going. This is a recent article from NBC News. It says that Donald Trump's allies are quietly getting involved in little notice fights over who will serve on the committee to set the Republican Party's national platform. NBC News spoke with nine people familiar with what's happening in states across the country, including Arizona, South Carolina, Kansas, and Iowa, among others, who said that the campaign's involvement is intended to stop those on the party's right flank from trying to push the official Republican National Committee platform too far to the right on issues like abortion and same-sex marriage headed into the general election. A Trump campaign official acknowledged to NBC News 
that there are conversations throughout the party about culture war infused policies and that they have been watching and engaged in some state level races for spots on the RNC's platform committee, which is the body that will play a significant role in shaping platform changes. The official also noted that it's not unusual for people most closely aligned with the president to get key convention roles. It says that um, one official, this official that they name in the article says, I know there are probably some people upset at us, but these positions are generally set aside for those who have been helpful to the president. And uh, we've got a clip on this. I'm going to save it till after the break regarding um, the, the reporter on this actually was asked point blank. Is there any pushback to this within the Republican Party? And uh, the answer is very interesting. But remember, the, the history on with the platform here, 2016, a strong pro-life platform. Then you have 2020. They did not change the platform at all. They just kept the same platform. And now it seems the Trump campaign has been maneuvering to say, let's really make sure we get our people in there to influence the RNC's platform committee. And uh, they're saying nothing to see here. This is not unusual. And um, but they're pushing it in a certain direction that certainly will water down um, what the platform is when it comes uh, to to being pro-life, when it comes to being anti-abortion. And that's a big problem. But but again, that's being shaken up, I think, right now. Father, any comment on this as we head into the break? Yeah, the left is going off the left cliff, right? And I really think I have always the the answer to it is not moving left. It's moving further right and give the people uh, in this country a clear choice, a clear choice in the direction they want the country to go in. I want to go back to the moral foundings of this country, pro-life, pro-marriage, pro-family, pro-constitution, or do they want to go off the left hip? We'll be right back. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On May 31st, we celebrate the Feast of the Queenship of Our Lady. The coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary as Queen of Heaven and Earth has been acknowledged throughout Church history, particularly in the fifth glorious mystery of the Holy Rosary. Yet there was no special feast for the Queenship until the year of our Lord 1954, when Pope Venerable Pius XII issued the encyclical Ad Celi Reginam to the Queen of Heavens. Pope Pius cites many references to Our Lady as Queen, summed up thusly by St. Alphonsus Liguri. Because the Virgin Mary was raised to such a lofty dignity as to be the mother of the King of Kings, it is deservedly and by every right that the Church has honored her with the title of Queen. The encyclical established a feast honoring the Queenship of Our Lady on May 31st, a fitting climax for the month dedicated to the Blessed Mother. In the modern calendar, this feast has been moved to the octave day of the Assumption, August 22nd. In the words of the encyclical, let all Christians therefore glory in being subjects of the Virgin Mother of God, who, while wielding royal power, is on fire with a mother's love. Also honored on this day are the Visitation of Our Lady in the modern calendar, Saint Petronilla, disciple and possible daughter of the Apostle Saint Peter, Saint Felix of Nicosia, Saint Camilla Battista da Varano, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Stephen Imbarato talking about the uh, the Trump campaign, Trump himself uh, behind this impetus to try to stock the, um, the, the RNC's platform committee uh, with people that are going to be uh, willing to basically retreat on life, retreat on marriage when it comes to putting together uh, the platform for the Republican Party, the national platform for the Republican Party coming up heading into the November election. And so um, so here you're going to you're going to hear the reporter ask, is there any pushback to this within the Republican Party um, to uh, another reporter who's been uh, researching this? Um, the answer is interesting. Here it is. 
Given that this has been a part of the party's platform for so long, logistically speaking, how would this work and, and how much pushback is there? There is a little bit of pushback uh, among the, the people we talk to in Republican Party circles. There are some social conservatives, those who have been members of the RNC for a very long time. There, there was a, a specific person who said, how are we going to get rid of decades of life language? And life language was the idea of, of sort of the traditional definition of marriage, sort of anti-abortion, that sort of stuff. So there is generally some some slight pushback. But if I were to sort of game this out, it's, it's President Trump and his team that are kind of getting into these very, very obscure and grassroots sort of races that are often getting very much attention. So more than likely, if you're a candidate who has President Trump or his team's support to try to get on this platform committee, you're probably going to win. So there's a conversation going on, but I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a civil war or anything of, of tension that rises too high because probably Trump's going to get his way as, as he generally does it in the party. All right. So the reporter here is saying this, this is no big war within the party because this is Trump's got Trump's got this in the bag. No problem. He's going to stock this thing with his own people. And of course, they're going to retreat on life and marriage already a done deal is basically what he's saying. There's going to be no fight on this. Um, but we, we want to give some evidence that uh, there that may be to the contrary on this. Again, things are being shaken up right now politically, so we want to keep those prayers going that the greatest good will come forth and that uh, Trump will maybe have a change of heart, change of mind in how he's approaching all of this at this point. But um, but let's go to Texas for the, for a very interesting example. Now, we've seen some grumblings. Uh, Father, you brought this to my attention from a group in Texas called Right to Win, who is trying to gather a grassroots movement to do something similar in Texas to, quote, take abortion off Republican platforms. We must win or else, end quote. But um, I'm also seeing reporting that the Republican Party of Texas delegates, they voted on a state party platform on Saturday, and they're not listening to these political idolaters as they voted it seems to be that they, they voted. Some reporting is saying that they finalized this. Some is saying that we don't know exactly if this is finalized yet, but it's a, a very clear proposal. Um, but they, it seems that they voted in favor of very strong anti-abortion language in the state party platform, including a section entitled Equal Protection for the Preborn that states the following. We urge lawmakers to enact legislation to abolish abortion by immediately securing the right to life and equal protection of the laws to all preborn children from the moment of fertilization because abortion violates the United States Constitution by denying such persons the equal protection of the law. End of quote. And another section entitled Abolish Abortion reads, quote, since life begins at fertilization, we urge the Texas legislature to abolish abortion through enacting legislation that would immediately secure the right to life and would nullify any and all federal statutes, regulations, orders and court rulings that would deny these rights. We urge the Texas legislature to enact legislation to abolish abortion by immediately securing the right to life and equal protection of the laws for all preborn children from the moment of fertiliza- fertilization and to oppose legislation that discriminates against any preborn children and violates the United States Constitution by denying such persons the equal protection of the laws and to adopt effective tools to ensure the enforcement of our laws to protect life when doctors or district attorneys fail to do so. So this is the best language I've seen in any state platform ever when it comes to this This is exactly what we talk about week in and week out. And let's hope that this is finalized or it gets finalized. And Texas is going uh, the route of abolishing abortion there. And hopefully that can bubble up to the national level. So good to see this. Father, your thoughts. Yeah, I I think that, you know, look at this uh, attorney general in Texas, Ken Paxton. And, of course, we know the governor is very pro-life. I would have a feeling that Paxton is is behind this, you know, or a great uh, influence on this. And, uh, you know, thank God for Texas. I mean, and they are a republic. And, and of course, the significance of Texas going in this direction is, is plain and simple uh, Trump can't win the presidency without Texas all right I mean that that's it all right 
And and so, you know, you and I live in Florida. We'd love to see Florida uh, follow suit and uh, see uh, uh, Governor DeSantis, who seems to be OK with the six week ban, the heart week, uh, heartbeat ban. And uh, and of course, the overwhelming majority of pro-life movements happy with it. But boy, I'd love to see Florida go in the same direction as Texas, because that would be a firewall. Texas and Florida acting together, that surely would be a firewall against any liberalization on the life issue of the Republican Party, because the Republican Party needs Texas and Florida to win any national election, any presidential election. So, uh, you know, it's it's interesting what's going on in Texas. Is Texas a microcosm or of 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 what's going on in the Republican Party? Well, uh, it, it probably is. I mean, uh, I keep hoping, I keep praying that the Trump of the first term is the Trump that still exists. And right now, for political expediency, he's moving to the center to try and gain as many independents as possible. And then when he wins the election, he will do what he was going to do in the first term, sign the presidential executive order on personhood and abolish abortion, become the new Lincoln. Uh, For that to happen, I think we're going to all need to get on our knees, pray and fast and hope that, again, the Trump of the first term is the Trump that still exists interiorly. And what we're seeing is just some type of political caricature that he feels is necessary to win the presidential election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another interesting thing that comes out of the, this platform in Texas is that the way that the leftist pro-abortion media wants to spin it. So this is what they did. And, And I've seen this in several places. This is an example from a Newsweek article from yesterday. It says that in Texas, capital murder is punishable by the death penalty or life in prison without parole. The category applies to cases with aggravating factors, such as for multiple murders or for the murder of an individual under the age of six. The article goes on to say that, quote, equal protection is a call for abortion to be treated as homicide, which it is, and for abortion patients to be prosecuted as murderers, which, in a sense, after this is made illegal, that also would be the case. However, they put this together, and you know what they named the article? Texas GOP proposes potential death penalty for women who get abortions. And this is a scare tactic, right, where they're trying to put this all together. Well, the death penalty exists in Texas, and so it's possible that the death penalty can be applied for a murder. So therefore, let's spin it that way and say they want to kill the moms who are killing their children. Now, we talked about this last week about um, about prosecuting women who have abortions, who um, after it's made illegal, that yes, there has to be some teeth in, in the law. When you murder a person, you murder a person. What are the consequences? That would have to be adjudicated in a court of law and figured out what are what is the culpability and all of that, just like they would do in any murder case. Um, however, um, and nobody is proposing that uh, this is death penalty for women who get abortions or anything like that. In fact, we talked about it last week that a uh, wise sort of nuance to this would be what they did previously in history when abortion was outlawed, which is they would oftentimes give immunity to the women who um, who killed the children or a part of killing the children in order to get them to flip on the abortionist or whoever it was that you really want to go after um, to break up the entire network. So we could certainly go after those of who is supplying abortion pills, who are, who, who's going to you know break up that whole network by getting those women to flip. But eventually, yes, you want a culture of life where no woman wants to murder her child um, because she, number one, understands that that is, ought to be unthinkable and totally wrong. But also, yes, the deterrent of when you murder somebody, there is co- legal consequences to that. However, I do want to add this before I get your comment, Father, an NBC News article. And again, I'm seeing this in various places. Teen Vogue published a similar article with this scare tactic. But this NBC News article from Sunday, that we're also seeing this at the same time. Theirs is on the rise of abortion abolitionists. And now they're talking about Operation Save America, which I'm not that familiar with, um, but it's saying that they promote legislation that would pave the way for women to be prosecuted and locked up for having abortions. And it did say in that article that the group's leader, 
Jason Storms. Again, I'm not familiar, um, but it says he was asked if he believed that women should face the death penalty in places that have capital murder statutes, and he responded, absolutely. So all of this is being used for the left to now pivot, and you're going to hear this talking point more and more and more. Um, Father, help us to to understand this a little bit better and to be ready um, when we see this more and more and what our response ought to be. Well, I guess it was a year or so ago after Dobbs when Texas was one of the first states, right, to come up with what their heartbeat ban is, a very effective ban. It's one of the most restrictive states in the entire country in terms of abortion, and we don't see uh, women being sent to the electric chair or being hung or being uh, thrown in jail uh, for murder. So it is a scare tactic. And again, uh, this is one of the legal issues issues that will be dealt with after the Supreme Court answers the simple question, when does our inalienable right to life that guarantees us equal protection under the law, when do we obtain that right? Um, And again, penalties for the different classifications of murder, uh, whether it be first degree, second degree, manslaughter, cold-blooded, warm-blooded, all this other stuff, um, it, it's always been left to the states and it's varied and really a, a kind of like a judicial discretion, right? Uh, so, yeah, this is a scare tactic. I, I, it doesn't surprise me that the other side is not going to use everything, every quiver in their, every uh, arrow in their quiver to try and scare the people. That should not at all uh, keep us from from just proclaiming what about the babies? What about the rights of the babies? What about the constitutional rights of the babies and not be swayed at? As we ha- see so many in the pro-life movement being swayed by backing off uh, this whole criminalization issue. Now, I will tell you, Jim, you know, my pulse and I'm, I'm pretty, I think I have my finger on the pulse of social media. There are an awful lot of serious, serious devout Catholics, serious, serious pro-lifers who are of the mind. All right, that we can't risk losing this election on the abortion issue, that we need to back off the abortion issue because if we lose this election, then we'll have nothing. Uh, this scares me to no end. And of course, I confront them with political idolatry and uh, they get offended. But this is exactly what it is. Putting politics and political expediency, political influence, before the babies is idolatry and we have to fight against it all right uh yes, we'll be yeah. back in a few minutes uh, the men go ahead jim no i was just gonna say yeah i want to promote uh, mlk one more time get the book why we can't wait we can't wait it needs to be now we'll be right back This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. Ten federal lawmakers say U.S. waterways may be unprotected from the effects of abortion and are appealing to the EPA. They say federal assessments in 1996 refused to consider the impact to health and safety of humans and wildlife. Critics have long held that human fetal remains and the drug's active metabolites pass untreated by typical wastewater systems into U.S. waterways. Facing an onslaught of White House measures to promote and expand abortion the nation's Catholic bishops are taking action. Wednesday's Wall Street Journal features Archbishop Timothy Broglio telling how bishops are suing the Biden White House. The article praises the 2022 employment law protecting pregnant workers, but explains how their lawsuit seeks to reverse President Biden's distorted interpretation of the law mandating employer assistance in abortion. This is Life News Radio. Persecution around the world has manifested itself through the centuries, but it is worse today than ever before. Aid to the Church in Need and its donors have been there to help since 1947, never abandoning the Church. Will you stand up for your faith and accompany our brothers and sisters on their spiritual journey? Visit churchinneed.org. churchinneed.org. 
The president and director of medical affairs for the Charlotte Lozier Institute has been appointed to the Texas State Committee that compiles data on pregnancy-related mortality. Delivering children, research, and policymaking are highlights of Texas OBGYN Dr. Ingrid Scopes' 30-year career. The abortion industry and other eugenics advocates are busy at the World Health Organization meetings in Switzerland. Among other proposals, reproductive health was touted as a solution to high maternal mortality. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Stephen Imbarato. Interesting uh, news story out of Boston, Massachusetts of what happens when we deny reality. Uh, NBC News article from Tuesday, man charged with, quote, misleading woman into taking abortion pill. Now, this wasn't misleading. This was totally and completely lying to this woman, this pregnant mom, in order to to get her to take these abortion pills, pretending that they were vitamin pills, iron pills, and uh, and the child was murdered because of this. Now, he's not being charged with murder, and he ought to be, but when we have a disconnect from reality, um, then that's going to be reflected in the legal system as we see when we're murdering thousands of children every single day in this nation and acting like it's no crime, nothing to see here. Uh, here's local Boston news uh, bringing uh, forth some more information on this story. Here it is. Robert Kawada accused of slipping his ex-girlfriend abortion drugs, telling her they were vitamins. He would provide the victims uh, the victim with pills that he informed her were iron pills or other vitamins. According to police here in Watertown, the two met on a dating app and were together for a couple months. After they broke up, she told him she was pregnant. The defendant would also check the victim's mouth by pulling on the victim's cheeks to ensure she had consumed the pills. The pills, say prosecutors, were consistent with misoprostol, one of two controversial abortion drugs at the center of a Supreme Court case. They're available in Massachusetts through prescription, and prosecutors say Kawada's phone showed a call to an online pharmacy that sells it. Police say it happened more than once and that at one point he even orchestrated a fake call from a nurse saying because of her blood work, she really needed to take the iron pills and he just happened to have some, which he gave to her. She was cold, shivering, and she felt very uneasy. The victim stated she went to sleep and woke up feeling like she had very bad cramps. When she had a miscarriage, prosecutors say he asked her to send pictures, court documents showing his cell phone search at the time, including nine-week aborted fetus pics, telephone voice changer, chewing misoprostol. All right, so this guy is a sick individual, and he should be charged with murder because it is murder. Instead, they call it misleading. They call it miscarriage. They charge him with poisoning and assault and battery. It's a complete disconnect from reality. This is what happens when we don't call things what they are and don't apply the law in in a right way according to objective reality. Um, We have sick people like this that are are basically, he's going to get away with this to some degree versus what he should actually uh, receive as a consequence of what he's done. Father, your thoughts? Yeah, so she died, right, in this process, what would they call it? Right. Surely if she died, the baby died. If he took out a gun and shot her in the abdomen and the baby died, and she died. It would be at least one homicide, if not two. In most states would be two homicides. But if she died in this process, what would it be? What would it be called? And again, you know, these are the types of cases. And I don't want to bring this down to some kind of like a judicial uh common denominator because this is a tragedy right this is just this is like you said he's a sick depraved individual but we need to understand that uh if we're not going to criminalize women you you know where then then you know you're going to get this type of stuff right when a guy tries to kill potentially well his baby 
kills his baby, mm-hmm. all right, but endangers the life of of the woman. Why, why isn't this attempted murder? Could she not possibly have died from this? Uh, yeah, this is, but again, this is a potentially a case that could end up in the Supreme Court, these types of cases. You know, for those out there that think that Jim and I paint a grim picture, I just want to encourage you. There's so many of these types of situations uh, happening all over the country. We only need one court case to make it to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court says, look it, finally, we, we have to make a decision. And if you notice, right, Jim talked about the Texas platform. The whole idea of constitutional person is coming up more and more and more and more. And I will tell you, the men's march to abolish abortion rally for personhood is a big part of this now becoming more and more prominent on the national scene, right? This whole idea of constitutional person from the moment of conception to abolish abortion. So please, we need everyone to talk this up, to go to rallyforpersonhood.com, to start Googling all right, constitutional personhood, to see the different cases that are going, uh, that are going on out there, and pray, pray and fast, because regardless of what's going on with Trump, regardless of what's going on with the House and the Senate, right now our focus is on the Supreme Court. And we have a majority in the Supreme Court that if indeed a personhood case is brought before them, they're going to have no choice but to recognize constitutional personhood and then let everything fall where it may. Uh, And indeed, it may bring a lot of havoc to this country for a long, long time, but it's necessary. There's no greater havoc than we've been experiencing the last 50 years with the daily mass murder of preborn children. Yeah, and, and we'll probably be talking about the Supreme Court next Friday. I would expect we're going to get that ruling on the chemical abortion pills sometime probably in the next week. Um, so we'll see. That ruling should come down. That should be interesting. But this is just another reason, this story, why these uh, these abortion pills, they need to be outlawed. I mean, you can just take these pills and, and you can lie to somebody and give them these pills and, and it kills their child. I mean, this is this is just a barbaric stuff that should not be around. Why are we creating these murder pills, these child murder pills? They need to be outlawed and at once. And so, yes, we need to demand that and keep saying this over and over again. We need to stand up for the personhood of every human being from conception, fertilization, and the ones that are most in need are obviously our preborn brothers and sisters being murdered by the thousands every day, hundreds of thousands worldwide. Uh, let, let's go to this worldwide uh, survey that came out. P- Pew Research Center uh, did this survey from earlier this month on support for legal abortion around the world. Majorities in most places surveyed support legal abortion, so says Pew Research Center here. But out of those surveyed, who doesn't support legal abortion? I thought this was interesting. So Mexico, 50% say abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. South Africa, 56%. Vietnam, 59%. Brazil, 70% say abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. Indonesia, 82%. Kenya, 88%. Nigeria, 91% say abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. The U.S., by the way, is um, 36%. So 63%, according to this survey in the United States, say that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. It also broke this down. This was interesting that 94% of liberals in America support legal abortion compared with only 30% of conservatives. But that 30% number obviously way too high uh, within those who call themselves conservatives. Um, But also remember this study that we brought forth, I think last week we've been talking about this, only 38% of Americans even believe the scientific fact that life begins at fertilization. And that kind of goes along with the number 36% in the U.S. being um, for making abortion illegal in all or most cases. 38% understand that that's the scientific fact. Life begins at fertilization. They, they go together here. We raise that number of when people, if people understanding this scientific fact, understanding reality, understanding this is child murder, then we raise that number of the people that are against it. This ought to be common sense. Uh, Also, though, attitudes toward abortion 
uh, it said in the article here on Pew Research, are strongly tied to how important people say religion is in their lives in places where a greater share of people say religion is at least somewhat important to them. Uh, much smaller shares think abortion should be legal. For example, 99% of Nigerians say religion is important in their lives and only 8% say abortion should be legal in all or most cases. On the opposite end of the spectrum, 20% of Swedes see religion as important and 95% of Swedes support legal abortion. People in India are outliers. I would say this is because Hinduism is quite different than Christianity. 94% in India view religion as important, but also 59% favor legal abortion. But this makes sense. Where Christianity is high, then there would be, you would be against murdering children if you understand the science and that this is a fact. These are human beings. We're murdering them. Christianity is that, is that, uh, that rock solid, um, beauty that we need, this moral truth, this moral clarity to say we don't murder each other. We don't kill each other. This is unthinkable. We have to be against this. And then finally, one last point, economic development, it says, also plays a role in this relationship. In places with lower GDP per capita, people tend to be more religious and have more restrictive attitudes about abortion. Uh, so to me, it seems like uh, those with with uh, a, a greater love of Jesus, and I would say also his Catholic Church, and also um, those with less mammon and less attachment to worldliness, these people are, are are seeing it as it is, and it's common sense. Let's end this. Let's make it illegal across the board. Father, how do you see it? Yeah, exactly. I was going to, you know, mammon is the key, right? I mean, you can't serve God, you can't serve Jesus and mammon. And I think the poor showing in the United States is uh, directly laid at the feet of the mainstream corporate pro-life movement. Again, I want to reiterate, if you go down the list of the uh, mainstream corporate pro-life leaders, almost to a person, they're all Catholic. They're all Catholic. And yet, if you go through social media and you scroll down Twitter or Instagram or Facebook um, uh, from all these pro-life leaders, you will see every particular topic other than the abortion issue. You'll see abortion issue, but not constitutional personhood, not Catechism 2270, human life begins at conception, person that begins at conception. Um, so I would like to see the narrative in those countries where large majorities think that abortion should be illegal in all or uh, most cases, uh, because the narrative here is nothing close to where it needs to be, considering the strength of our Constitution, right? That's the key. What are the constitutions of those countries look like? We know what the religious makeup of those countries. Most of them, as you pointed out, you laid out the case very, very well. Well, here we're supposed to be a Christian Judeo ethic country. We have a mainstream corporate pro-life leadership that is primarily Catholic. We have 2270 in the catechism. We have a very strong constitutional narrative, but it's not making it to the people. And therefore, we have people who are confused on when life begins, the connection between when life begins to personhood, the connection between personhood when life begins, and the daily mass murder of pre-born children. So, uh, again, it goes back to what you and I have been saying week in and week out now for years. Uh, we need to just just simplify the message and have a unified message within the movement on right, abolishing abortion through constitutional personhood. The headline could be, what about the inalienable right to the life to the baby, right? The baby's right to life, the baby's inalienable right to life. Uh, it's really quite a simple message, all right, that uh, needs to be put out there and can be put out there. And the fact that it's not putting out there and the fact that everybody's confused is very telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be great if leaders of church and state and those in the pro-life movement would stand up and proclaim it. And we're certainly continuing to call on them to do so. But also that's why over the years here, we've also seen the need to say, well, we better get down into the grassroots and start telling folks in the grassroots, you're the leaders. 
right? You have a leadership responsibility too um, with those within your sphere of influence. And so that's really what I think the Men's March and Rally for Personhood comes out of. And so we want to gather together. Whoever hears me right now, do whatever you can to be with us in Rochester, New York, June 22nd, Saturday, June 22nd. It's the weekend after Father's Day. It's the Dobbs anniversary weekend, uh, the the home of Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist. We're going to be there. We're going to start off in front of the Killing Center. We're all going to march together to the rally point, a place where Frederick Douglass himself once spoke. And we're going to proclaim this truth. Right, And we are going to stand up and be a light in the darkness. We need to stand up publicly and tell the truth about this. It's got to start somewhere. Let it start here. Let it start with us. Gather together, themensmarch.com, rallyforpersonhood.com. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. A prayer to the Sacred Heart that St. Gertrude the Great wrote. I salute thee, O Sacred Heart of Jesus, living and vivifying source of eternal life infinite treasure of the divinity ardent furnace of divine love thou art the place of my repose and my refuge enkindle in my heart the fire of that ardent love with which thine own is inflamed pour into my heart the great graces of which thine is the source and grant that my heart may be so closely united to thine that thy will may be mine, and that my will may be eternally conformed to thine, since I desire that henceforth thy holy will may be the rule of all my desires and all my actions. Amen. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTague, your daily host of The Catholic Current. Join me on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern for another round of Let's Talk About This when we walk through a complex issue together. Here's a question for all of us. What to do when the truth hurts? I'll share with you some hard-won wisdom. Don't miss out. Join us on The Catholic Current on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. At the Station of the Cross, we understand that life circumstances can affect your giving options, whether by moving or by switching banks and credit card numbers. Please let us know if recent changes have been made to your payment information so that we can better serve you as you continue to bless us with your financial support. Update your information today at thestationofthecross.com or by calling 1-877-888-6279, extension 104. Jim Havens here with Father Stephen Imbarato. Uh, let's uh, let's bring out this news item. Um, I saw this Pope Francis interview recently with Nora O'Donnell. I think she's a, an anchor on CBS, and I saw a very short amount of it. I, I think this was aired on 60 Minutes. It was maybe about 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And then I also noticed this past week a fuller version, an hour version, and I so I sat down and I watched that. And um, I, I, I got to bring up a couple of things here, I think, that are worthy for all of us to be aware of, because, again, it's an example of leadership and where our current leadership is um, with respect to church and state uh, that this in this example, that the highest level within the church. And th- this first clip, you'll hear Pope Francis saying something very good. Right. So it's highlighting, I think, something that he is very right about in terms of a general understanding of something that he's seen in terms of like a global indifference, I'll let him talk about it. And then you'll hear the second clip of what he thinks is kind of like the most important thing when he's asked about that. And, um, and let's just look at the juxtaposi- juxtaposition of these two things and, and just, I guess, make sure that we're, again, taking a good view of what's going on right now. Here's the first clip. Pope Francis took his first trip as Holy Father in 2013 to Lampedusa, a small Italian island near Africa, where he delivered a big message. I was so struck when you talked about the globalization of indifference. What is happening? Do you want me to speak plainly? People wash their hands. There are so many who see what is happening, the wars, the injustice. 
That's okay, that's okay, and wash their hands. It's indifference. They make comments about such dramatic events that are going on as though they were just at a sports match, no? Please, we have to get our hearts to feel again. We cannot remain indifferent in the face of such human dramas. The globalization of indifference is a very ugly disease. Mr. Speaker, the Pope of the Holy See. In 2015, Pope Francis was the first pontiff to address Congress. All right, let, let's pause it there. So yeah, in that first bit, so some good things there that he's saying, right? That this globalization of indifference, people are washing their hands. Now he doesn't talk about child murder, about abortion, uh, but that's where people are most washing their hands, I would argue, not seeing this reality. And that, yes, we, we, need, to, we need to have our hearts moved as he's saying here, to what is going on. Uh, again, thousands every day in our own nation, hundreds of thousands worldwide in terms of loss of human life in this worldwide child murder. And yes, of course, there's this global indifference to it. So I think he's highlighting it. He just doesn't seem to be connecting the dots to abortion, or at least he doesn't explicitly state it, or at least um, not within that edit does he state it, I guess, to be completely uh, fair and give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, but I left that last bit on, too, about him addressing Congress. They went into into that a bit. And, and I wanted to leave that on because that reminds me of where I started to really see cracks in the pontificate of Pope Francis. I think people have seen different things over time. That, for me, was the thing where he addressed Congress and again, a long speech before Congress didn't even say the word abortion, didn't even bring it up. And I just and I just couldn't believe it at the time. I thought about my hero, Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta. If she had that opportunity before Congress, of course she would. And of course she would correct them um, with clarity and charity. But that's not what we saw. And, and I was very disappointed by that at the time. And again, I'm a guy that I gave him the benefit of the doubt big time early on in the pontificate. I remember even standing up to a Protestant guy in a coffee house one day because he was saying something disparaging about the Pope based on the headlines that I thought were being misconstrued at the time. Um, but in, in this in this second part here, and then Father, we'll get your comments on it. Um, I think, again, it just shows the disconnect here. He's not connecting this all to abortion. And when he is asked about the most important issue before us, he turns to climate change instead and Again, I just, there's no, I guess, excuse for this in my mind. Here it is. You've talked about what St. Francis called Sister Mother Earth, that protecting our planet is the most pressing issue today? Yes, because it is the future. It is life. We say it the most stepsister Earth not sister, protecting the planet. How many young people today will not get to see so many things? It is a lack of conscience to use a plastic bottle and then throw it to the sea. All right, so talking about the future and climate change, abortion obviously massively affects the future. We're murdering children and talking about we need to have our consciences um, more sensitive when we're throwing plastic into the sea. And look, I'm against pollution, against throwing plastic into the sea, obviously. But just how is he missing it when there's so something so much bigger, so much greater, not even close, not even in comparison, and this is what he's going to. And then when this trickles down and other bishops are seeing this and then priests are seeing this and lay people are seeing this, the world is seeing this. Again, I think it just makes it all the more easy for them to do the same thing and wash their own hands, ironically, to what ought to be the right response to this ongoing daily mass murder. Father, your thoughts? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, I mean, not to minimize uh, all of this because it is, I mean, the Pope could talk about abortion every day. And, and, and people, let, let's put this in context, okay? 
Uh, I mean, I'm a I'm a climate change denier. Okay, so I want to put that right out there. Okay, uh, why am I a climate change denier? Because I don't believe it's the preeminent issue facing the world. Two hundred thousand babies are being mass murdered worldwide every day. You've been hearing that number week in and week out right here on this show. Two hundred thousand babies, Jim and I. Now that's. One, two, three, four years have been talking about that, right? Um, So, you know, the Pope could talk about it every single day. As far as climate change, there's six or eight articles in Laudato C that talk about uh, care for the environment and how care for the environment cannot at all be a reason why we ignore the pre-born uh, uh, population reduction, uh, all of these other things. The, the fact is that, you know, you and I talked about going back during the, the global pandemic, 25 years of ignoring Evangelium Vitae, right? And the church being rendered non-essential while the abortion industry was essential. Um, I, I guess the only benefit of the doubt that I'll give the Pope and JP2 and the church is that they have a whole, whole lot of things that they have to worry about and they have to deal with. However, all that being said, they surely are not doing everything they possibly can. And to bring the issue, the daily mass murder of the pre-born to the forefront, uh, the Pontifical Academy for Life and the Pontifical Academy for Science are the two perfect examples where the Pope, unfortunately, has put people in those two academies that are not upholding life, are not upholding the basic scientific principles that underscore life. Uh, it is very disappointing, all right? And uh, I, I'm not going to defend the, the, the Catholic Church, the Magisterium, or the Pope, all right? But I will tell you, my ordination card right here, folks, my ordination card is a prayer for the Pope, bishops, and priests. We've been praying this thousands of people since the day of my ordination, all right? Uh, we need to pray it every single day. You can go to my website, protestchildkilling.com. Get this prayer. We need to get on our knees, folks, first and foremost, on our knees, pray and fast. Then we need to act. That's why rallyforpersoner.com, the mensmarch.com, all right? The Pope talked about indifference. Don't be indifferent. Come up to Rochester. All right. Be with us there. Let's abolish abortion. Let's put an end to this daily mass murder of preborn children. May Almighty God bless you all. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Go out and give them heaven. Amen.